One of the most important statistics in normal regression analysis is the R-square, which tells us how well the model explains the dependent variable. In generalized linear models and other nonlinear models, the R-square doesn't exist, or even if it can be calculated, its interpretation is not the same as the normal R-square in normal regression analysis. We call these alternative statistics as pseudo R-squares. And in this video, I will take a look at the different pseudo R-squares in logistic regression analysis. The same principle applies to any nonlinear models. The actual statistics could be slightly different. So some pseudo R-squares that I will cover are specific logistic regression. Some are applicable to, to any maximum likelihood estimates of any generalized linear model. Let's take a look at first what R-square quantifies so that we can understand what pseudo R-squares tell us and what they don't tell us. So this is the equation for R-square. The R-square is calculated, this is one of the ways, but it's calculated based on uh, the residuals. So we have the residual variance here and uh, we take the residuals, it's the sum of, uh, it's a difference between the predicted value Predicted value and observed value, we take squares and then we take sum of squares. Then we have uh, a prediction calculated by the sample mean only. So this is a prediction from a model with intercept only. So this is the, uh, the prediction from null model, how far they are from the observed values. And this is the predictions uh, from the actual model. So we compare, uh, for example, uh, how much better the estimated model is over a model that, that shouldn't really predict the variance in the dependent variable at all. So R-square has a couple of different roles. It can quantify the amount of variance explained in the data. If R-square is zero, then the model doesn't explain any variance in the data. If R-square is one, then the model explains all the variance in the data. R-square also quantifies model fit. So uh, R-square of one means that it's a perfect model, fits perfectly. R-square zero means that it's, it's uh, equivalent to the null model that doesn't explain the data at all. And then we have a third interpretation, which is how well the predictions from the model correlate with the actual observed values. We also have a, a couple of different two, two other features in R-square. One is that the estimation criterion in normal regression analysis is maximizing the R-square. So you maximize the variance explained and then that will give you the OLS estimates. Also R-square can be used in nested model comparisons using the F-test. These uh, last two uh, criterion are not very useful for pseudo R-square. So uh, pseudo R-square only focuses on, on these uh, first three aspects of R-square because pseudo R-squares are typically calculated based on the maximum likelihood estimates and there is not always a straight relationship between the, the estimation criterion and the pseudo R-square. And also pseudo R-squares can be used for model comparisons or model comparison, nested model testing the same way that R-square can be used. You can use the likelihood, uh, log likelihood statistic directly as the maximization criteria and for model testing. But for interpretation purposes, uh, the pseudo R-squares are uh, tell us some information about these uh, three uh, characteristics. So they can tell us how much the model explains of the data, how much better the data is than the null model, and uh, how much better the model is than the null model, and uh, how well the model predicts. So we have three, how much it explains the improvement over null model and prediction. So these three characteristics. And generally we can have only at most two in these in any pseudo R-square. So pseudo R-square, uh, if it's uh, meant to quantify prediction, then it, it's not necessarily good for quantifying how much uh, the model improves over the new model, or it doesn't uh, tell us how much the model explains the data. The reason why we have so many different pseudo R-squares is that these three objectives, th different objectives are important and sometimes we want to emphasize one objective over another. So this is a, a list of, of some of the pseudo R-square values of pseudo R-square statistics for logistic regression analysis. There are maybe um, a dozen more, but these are perhaps the most common. So this is the normal R-square. We're just calculating R-square and uh, using the, the normal equation. So we take the, uh, the predicted values uh, and we calculate the residual using predicted values. 
then we calculate the difference from the mean value and that gives us uh, the uh, r square that's uh, attributed to f from. So that's uh, but this is not very very useful because it while it's the same uh, equation than the normal r square it doesn't really tell us anything that normal r square does. Then we have the ones that are more commonly used. So McFadden r square co uh, compares the likelihood rate like log likelihood of the model against the new model. The idea is that the log likelihood of a perfectly fitting model is uh, zero and this will go to one and uh, the log likelihood of the worst possible model that doesn't explain the variation of the dependent variable at all is uh, the null model. So that's uh, this ratio goes to one and the McFadden's R, R square goes to zero. So that uh, quantifies the improvement over the null model. The, another commonly used is uh, Cox and Snell. The uh, idea of this equation is that it's uh, basically are uh, the same as this equation but calculated using the divisions residuals. So this is uh, if you calculate max normal linear regression analysis using maximum likelihood and you apply this equation then you will get the normal r square. The problem with this equation is that uh, the maximum is less than one it can be substantially less than one and another uh, pseudo r square that takes that weakness into account if you consider it a weakness is the Nagelkerkes r square which is basically just a scaled version of the Cox and Snell r square so that the maximum is one. So it's Cox and Snell divided by one minus log likelihood null uh, to the power of two divided by n which is the maximum of this this equation here. So those are the ones uh, based on the likelihood. Then we have uh, the uh, McElveny and uh, Chavoinas pseudo r square. This is uh, an r square in, in the sense that it's uh, how much variation is explained. So there is variation ex explained plus variation explained plus variation of the error term. So this is uh, if you apply this to normal regression analysis you will get the normal r square. The difference is that we are not looking at uh, the predictions in, in the uh, Observed variable instead of we are using the, the latent variable formulation of the logistic regression model and uh, we are looking at how well the model explains the latent response variable, uh, the latent uh, variable that underlies the response variable instead of the response variable itself. I have another video that explains the latent variable interpretation. Then we have two simple uh, statistics that quantify actually how well the model predicts. We have the count r square and uh, the count r square simply classifies each observation into those into the number that it's uh, more likely. So if a predictive probability for an observation is 51 percent then the predictive value in the count r square for that observation is 1. If the predicted uh, probability for observation is 49 percent then uh, the predicted value is 0 for the count r square. Then you just calculate how many predictions you got correctly and you divide by sample size. If you uh, predict randomly, the count r square will be uh, 50 percent. So basically uh, this r square will always be really high. Uh, it's almost never below 50 percent and it could get, go up up to uh, close to 100 percent. Then we have a uh, coefficient of determination or uh, discrimination which is uh, a bit more recent introduced by Tew in 2009 and this is also called Tew pseudo r square. The idea is that we focus on the probability of the prediction. So we calculate uh, the mean probability of those cases that had a value of 1, the mean of predictive probability of cases that had a value of 0 and then we calculate the difference between the means. So this quantifies whether the model predicts uh, successes and failures differently. If there's a large difference in how successes and failures are predicted then it implies that the model is, is good for prediction and uh, it has a high coefficient of discrimination and high pseudo r square. Let's take a look at the examples because these uh, statistics are quite different. So this is uh, some data sets and uh, we have the blue line is linear regression model and uh, the, um, the red line is logistic regression analysis. We have a couple of scenarios. In the first case uh, the model doesn't explain the data at all. So the r square in all is zero. And we can see that all of these r squares are close to zero except uh, 
adjusted version of McFadden's R score, which is negative. So we have this uh, adjusted R score here as well. So the, uh, if we, we had a adjusted R score for the OLS, that would probably be negative as well. Importantly, the count R square is 52%. So our uh, model doesn't explain data at all, but still we get half of the predictions correctly because you know, if we predict randomly, then we will get uh, uh, one or zero variable correctly with a 50% probability. Then we have a, a scenario here where uh, the logistic regression curve and the regression line overlap. So this is the, uh, the scenario where it wouldn't really matter whether you use logistic regression analysis or normal regression analysis because the predictive probabilities are between 20 and 80 percent. Ideally in this case uh, an ideal pseudo R square would probably agree with the OLS R square which we can see here that the Cox and Snell R square does and the Tur R square does but and also the Ephraim's because that's uh, calculated the same way as the uh, normal R square. But for example the Neger Karke R square is pretty high, McFadden's is, is too low and uh, count 74 percent so that really uh, tells us something very different than what the normal R square does. So if you, if you were to uh, if you want to say that the model doesn't explain the data at all then you can pick the McFadden uh, adjusted R square. If you want to say that the model predicts well then you pick the count R square. So it's kind of like pick your own result scenario. Of course you should justify your choice and, and if you want to uh, sit, like answer a question how much variation in the data explains then the count R square will be uh, inappropriate for that. Then we have a model um, where um, the S-curve and the line start to depart. So the S-curve clearly uh, bends down here and uh, the line gives us invalid predictions. Predictions exceeding one, predictions are uh, below zero. And this is a scenario where we would uh, really should not be using a linear model. Again, we see that the values are quite different. So uh, some of them are close to R square from OLS, some are not. And uh, then we have the final which is a scenario which is interesting. This is the perfect prediction scenario. So the model predicts perfectly when uh, the x is uh, below a cutoff, then uh, y is always zero. When the x is above cutoff, y is always positive. The uh, count and tier are square interestingly both uh, show that it's perfect predictions. This uh, scenario demonstrates that the Cox and Snell, even if the model predicts perfectly, the Cox and Snell will not be one. So uh, all these uh, provide you a different value. So uh, the question now is which one should you use? And of course this is a, a balanced model where we have uh, ones and zeros that are equally uh, with equal probabilities. We can have a model where the ones are three times as prevalent as zeros and then uh, these R squares will give us again a slightly different values. The problem is that uh, people don't realize that these quantify different things. So when you take a look at our published examples, published papers, how they apply pseudo R squares, quite often you see a pseudo R square reported in a regression table. In an ideal case there are two or three and uh, then they are just there, they are not reported. Sometimes they are, uh, they are not interpreted. Sometimes they are interpreted and uh, typically researchers interpret them as if uh, they were the same as OLS R square. So there, for example, you are comparing that uh, there is a 11.9 percent difference and uh, that would be the difference between uh, 22 and, and 35 here. It's not clear whether uh, you can actually uh, interpret the difference in Nagelkarke R square and how you would do that. But nevertheless, people think that you interpret these the same way as R squares. So what's the, uh, how should these be used then. There is uh, quite a lot of disagreements on the value of these uh, pseudo R squares. I have my opinions, others have their opinions. They, um, there's an article in Strategy Management Journal that goes over uh, the use of logistic and probit models in this journal and um, in the end they have a recommendations table and they're basically saying that uh, model fit you have to assess it somehow and uh, there is a uh, disagreement on, on whether you should have uh, a pseudo R square or not. If you have one, you should really pay attention to it and, and report that it's not a normal R square and it should not be interpreted as such. And uh, then they give some other advice. So, uh, so what's my take? It's that uh, don't include pseudo R squares. So that's my first recommendation. If you don't know what to do, just leave it out. It doesn't really uh, 
hurt anyone that you leave out the statistic that your readers don't know how to, uh, uh, how to interpret properly and if you don't interpret it yourself. There are exceptions to this rule. If you have a good reason to, uh, to a uh, good specific reason to include one, for example, if you want to know how well the model classifies, if you have a problem where you are interested in classifying cases, then uh, the count or the cure R screw could be very useful. So, but you have to have a specific reason for a specific coefficient instead of just going for the, for the Cox and Snell and Nagel character, which are the two most common perhaps. Interpret the effect size graphically instead. So, so show other readers how does the logistic regression curve go. That's much more useful than giving them a pseudo R score that they don't know how to, how to interpret. Then if you're asked to include pseudo R scores, sometimes you write a paper and uh, then you send out to, uh, to review and the reviewer is used to looking at regression results and they always to have, ha expect to have the R score for the regression results. But they have your log logistic regression analysis results without any R score statistic. The reviewer thinks that there should be one. So what do you do about it? Or your co-author thinks that uh, there should be one. one of, in one of my articles, uh, I, I, a co-author of mine wanted to have pseudo R square and I gave uh, him a pseudo R square of 20 and a pseudo R square of 50 and I told him which one would you like to have. And that was the, uh, the end of the discussion. We didn't include him pseudo R squares because there was no reason to. But it's uh, very common that people want to have an R square because normal regression analysis has one. In the, I wouldn't argue against the reviewer. So but I guess the co-author, it's okay. But, uh, I would just include a, a pseudo R square of you if a reviewer asks me to. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. In that case, I would use multiple. So I would have uh, at least the McFadden, Cox and Snell, and Tures. I wouldn't use the Nagelkarker because it tends to overestimate all as R square, and uh, you don't want to uh, use statistics uh, that make your model look more impressive than it actually is. So that's one rule that you should be conservative in what you present. And then uh, if you are uh, asked to interpret the R square, I would interpret the, the two R square. So, um, so that's my point, my take. This is the take from, um, from a, a, a person who wrote a, a paper to a strategic management journal. So what do the experts say? Let's take a look at the, uh, the book by Hosmer and Lemerson and Studevan. This is uh, the uh, best book in, in logistic regression analysis. It's a bit technical, but it's, it's a very, very uh, good explanation. And for example, many of the diagnostics that we use for logistic regression analysis are based on, on the ideas presented in this book. They basically say that uh, the, the pseudo R scores are not that useful. They don't allow you to uh, test whether the model is, is misspecified or not. There are better tools for that. And also, people who are used to reading logistic uh, normal regression analysis results and they see that uh, there are R squares from logistic analysis results, they will be confused. So you have a statistic that is not use, very useful for model diagnostics or, or analyzing whether the model is any good and a statistic that is uh, likely to uh, mislead your readers. Then uh, the clear recommendation is that you probably shouldn't include those. But understanding the pseudo R squares is important because uh, oftentimes reviewers want you to include one and quite often when you read a paper it does include one.